Hey, this is Mike Brangatelli. This is Mike Adelic. Welcome back to the show. Welcome to the show. It's a new episode. It's a new dawn. It's a new day. It's a new you. It's a new me. Even though it doesn't feel like it, we are moving forward through time, I suppose. I don't know. What is that even mean? It feels like Groundhog's Day every day because it's life living in a pandemic every day feels kind of like the last and you're not really sure if it's future or past pandemic na 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 the winner of 20 golden globe awards and tony award musical for the best i don't even know what that what, what's the award show the winner of 20 tony awards the new hit broadway pandemic at the winter garden theater that's 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 gonna happen that's totally going to happen. Pandemic, pandemic. Did someone say shelter in place? I'm not sure if there's zombies eating my face. Oh, pandemic, pandemic. <laughs> uh, I should have been, I should have written musicals. I, I came up with another one. There was Ayahuasca the musical. I think that would be great. I mean, I, I haven't really seen that, that yet, but, you know, like, Venturing to the jungle. Now, the, the male voices are always like a little like, I tried to. <laughs> they, I, I've only been to like two Broadway shows in my life, but I get like the basic gist of it is like the structure is always they're They're talking, but they're talking in a, a sort of a weird way because they have to project their voices. And then it kind of mutates into a. Uh, a singing and then the dancing and then it all happens and then that's the musical part you know so they'd be like talking well i went down to the store the other day to check and see if i could buy a prescription for something oh yes and what did they say well he said go to the jungle young man you need to seek a shaman to help you with your neuroses there's a lot of trauma that we're carrying around And maybe ayahuasca comes from the ground And you can be a part of changing the history <laughs> I'm telling you I'm gonna f- I'm, I'm Fuck this whole podcast shit Forget all this like Intellectual deep diving and heady nonsense I'm going right into writing musicals Who's with me? I'm gonna start a GoFundMe And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pump out musicals I think I got it in me I think I got the musical bug i think i've got the musical bug (laughs) no i'd be like i think i have the i think i i think i have the musical bug and then and then someone else would be like why whatever do you mean well i mean today we're talking about a man named gene gene gebser the musical all right okay okay well I I sure hope that was as entertaining for you as it was for me. I have a feeling it's probably more entertaining for me, but this is what you're getting. You're getting, this is Mike Adelic, okay? This is an audience Adelic. Um, (laughs) So anyway, listen, we got a great episode for you today. This is uh, with Jeremy Johnson. Jeremy Johnson is is one of the smartest human beings uh, I've ever met, and I'm glad to have met him through Isolation Tank, our bi-weekly live streaming show that streams onto the Evolve and the Ascend Facebook page and also DMT, the Spirit Molecule. Check it out. Links are in the show notes. It's a lot of fun. So many interesting, talented, creative, poetic, uh, artistic human beings manifesting over in the isolation tank. And uh, Jeremy is one of them. Jeremy is the author of a book, Seeing Through the World, Gene Gebser and Integral Consciousness. And that he is expanding upon these ideas of the German Swiss philosopher, poet, and uh, intellectual mystic Gene Gebser, uh, who is someone who is new to me. And and man, am I happy to be introduced to Gene Gebser and be introduced to Jeremy Johnson and all the work that he's doing to expand on these ideas of one of his biggest influences in the evolution of consciousness and integral studies and futurism and. Uh, and and really, um, you know, it's just it's just really really fascinating to dive into this stuff because it's you know as someone like me who's always curious 
Gene Gebser's never popped into my reality bubble, you know? And so now finding this and finding Jeremy and having read some things and listened to some things, I'm really, really fascinated. And we had a great chat about, uh, about a lot of this kind of way and modes of human thought and consciousness and evolving and, you know, not, not necessarily delineated by particular uh, times and, and places that are static and, uh, you know, in this linear way from past to present to future, but actually in a way of all moments in the sort of ever-present origin, which is uh, Gene Gebser's magnum opus book. And so this conversation with Jeremy is great. I highly suggest checking out all of the links that I put in the show notes, show description. I still don't know what to call it, show notes, show description, whatever. But check them all out because there is a wealth of knowledge and wisdom to dive into there. And if you're like me, which I assume you probably are similar to me in some aspect, which is why you listen to this show, I'm always looking to find the more nuance, the more uh, intricate, the more in-depth areas of human consciousness, modes of thought, ways of being in the world, and how to make sense of, of it all, and to know where we've, where we've been and where we are and where we're going and what's emerging and what's, what's uh, ever-present as well, and, um, and what's mutating, and these mutations, this is the name of Jeremy's podcast as well, Mutations, and, and that is what uh, Gebser describes, these, uh, these series of mutational leaps in the history of human consciousness. And, uh, and there's you know, this, this phrase, the map is not the territory, and I think that that really uh, applies to a lot of this kind of way of thinking, is like, you know, trying not to pin down so much a concrete, stagnant, static, structural, uh, concrete, if you will, framework, but to introduce a more fluid, more nuanced, more flowing, more interconnected, integral uh, framework that, uh, that I guess like the, the framework and the contents within it are kind of always expanding Again, mutating, growing, breathing, stretching up and down and left and right, and that the contents and the content of it all are, and then how we perceive it to be. Already, I'm I'm starting to kind of muddy the waters of what Jeremy could explain so much better than me. So I'll just cut it there and just say that Jeremy's a smart guy and he's fascinating, and I'm learning so much, and I loved having him on the show. Because I, he introduced me to this. This is all sort of new to me, you know. Th- these uh, these areas of of uh, exploration, and so uh, and it's great because j- you know I think that oh man, like I've I'm pretty w- I'm pretty well read. I, I know like a lot of things, but I always love when something really new comes into my uh, into into my uh, worldview, and I'm able to kind of explore that. And so that's why Jeremy's here. That's what Jeremy does. And, uh, and yeah, go check out all of his stuff in there. He's, um, got a new magazine, online magazine called Liminal News. Um, and he runs the Mutations podcast. He also has a podcast called Growing Down. So there's just a ton of stuff. It's all in the links there. He's a wonderful, fascinating person and, uh, glad to get to know him and hope you guys enjoy this show. Now, before we get into the conversation, I'll just say that, uh, thank you so much for your love and support. Appreciate all the five-star ratings and reviews that you leave on Apple podcasts. When you go to Apple podcasts and you're subscribed to Mike Adelic, please do that. If you haven't already subscriptions, that's, uh, It sounds weird to say it, subscriptions. It's like, I feel like I'm going door to door selling magazines, but just subscribe to the show if you haven't already, wherever you listen to podcasts. And Apple Podcasts is a great place to go to support the show. If you really are excited about what's going on here and what what we're doing and and love these conversations, just tap five stars down where it says rate and review. And uh, you could also leave a little something if you like. Some people write things, some people don't, you don't have to. But I always love to hear what you guys have to say. 
and it really makes my day, makes my week. I mean, I, I love checking that because it's a, it's a, a feedback loop to see, you know, am I doing a good job? Do people like the show? Is the show good? Is you know, what are they saying? What excites them the most? So go let me know on Apple Podcasts. Leave a five-star rating and review. Let me know what excites you most about the show and what you love about it. And uh, I'll be sure to give you a shout out on the next podcast. And uh, I really appreciate that. It's a great way to support the show that's 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 free. Another way to support the show financially is to go to patreon.com slash Mike Brank. I've just reorganized my, patron, uh, my Patreon for the patrons that are already there. They're all sort of like grandfathered in. So kind of, uh, you know, first come, first serve sort of thing, I guess. But from now on, I have uh, a bunch of different ways that you could support the show with different tiers, different membership uh, gifts and goodies and bonus episodes and um, early access release episodes and also the private inner sanctum. The Mycadelic Inner Sanctum what, uh, Discord server, which is great. We used to be on WhatsApp, but I transferred it over to Discord, which is really, really awesome. So check that out. And uh, yeah, you can um, support the show on Patreon, or you can go to my website, mikebrank.com, and you could uh, do maybe a one-time donation if you want on PayPal, if you don't want to get into the whole monthly Patreon thing. But the good thing about Patreon is we're developing more of a community over there, and there's going to be more and more bonus content being put out over there. So uh, be on the lookout for that, and uh, and check it out. You could always you could always support this show, and then if you decide you know it's not something that you want to do, you can you can leave. So that's uh, that's always good to to do. Is it always good to do? I don't know. It's, sometimes I say, I just yeah. Well, that's that's a, that's a thing that, uh, and that's a that's a type of thing that you can do. All right. Well, uh, yeah. And then also, yeah, hemp bombs, hempbombs dot com. I I always forget about them. I don't know. They're still sponsoring the show. You get fifteen percent off on hemp uh, derived CBD products. They ship everywhere in the United States. You know, they got some some great stuff. They got hemp CBD, uh, sex lube. They got freeze cream to take the pain away. They got gummies. They got stuff for your dogs, your pets. I mean, is it the greatest CBD in the world? Probably not. I don't know. I mean, is it good? Is it decent? Yeah, sure. If you're interested in CBD, you want to check it out, you want to give it a try, you get 15% off if you put in the code Mike15. Um you know, so we'll give it a shot. Why not? You know, we, we, we the other day I bought these uh, dried mangoes from Natural Grocers and I thought they were going to be just like the ones that I got at Trader Joe's. But you know what? They weren't. They weren't as good. But, uh, you know, what am I going to do? So, you know, I don't know how that fit in here. But anyway, you know, try things. They're a sponsor. They're they're sponsoring. Yeah, like I said, I mean, are they great? Are they the best? Do they work? Is it magic? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's something, you know? I mean, you got to, if you like CBD, if you want to, you know, take the pain away a little bit, try them out. Give them a try. You get 15% off. What's the, you know, what's the harm in that, right? So you try it out. You get 15% off. If it's good, it's good. If it's not, you know, you just don't get it again. Whatever. You don't always have to get the best thing. You don't have to spend hours and hours researching. You know, and nobody knows. Everybody's physiology is different. What might work for someone might not work for you. So, you know, you know, I do a really good job of uh, of promoting sponsors on this show. I think I have to say so. Uh, give them a, go. Check them out. Hempbombs.com. Put in the code Mike fifteen for fifteen percent off. How about that? All right, without further ado, let's dive into this conversation. You know, uh, this, is a, this is a great one. I'm sure that you guys are going to want to Google a lot of things and search a lot of things. Check out all the links that I put for Jeremy and all the work that he's putting out there and what he's involved in. Get, get, in, you know, get involved. If you, if you find this conversation appealing, go check out uh, more of his stuff. There's, uh, there's no limits to the the area of ideas that he's uh, opening up into. So uh, please, uh, and join us for Isolation Tank, streaming live on the Evolve and Ascend Facebook page and the DMT Spirit Molecule page every Tuesday and Friday. You can check that out there, the link's there too. All right, without further ado, let's get this conversation with Jeremy Johnson. Psychedelics are illegal, not because a loving government is concerned that you may jump out of a third-story window, Psychedelics are illegal because they dissolve opinion structures and culturally laid down models of behavior and information processing. They open to us the possibility that everything we know is wrong. 
We don't need new laws that control our consciousness and rigidly place it in a prison. Cognitive liberty. The fact that as adults, if we're not hurting anybody else, we should have the right to explore the contours of our own consciousness without any mediation or legislation on the part of somebody else. Reject the authority. Authority is a lie. Or is it perception? Information is power. But we have to seize, seize the, opportunity. the opportunity. The opportunity. And, and I'm like, damn, I'm like, this is good. I was like, I wish I had more time to, but this is why you're on the show, I guess. So you can help kind of, uh, you know, uh, wet our metaphorical whistles, so to speak, into, uh, seeing through the world, which Mm -hmm. is your, your, uh, your book that you, uh, so graciously sent me to, to read. Um, and yeah, I wanted to have you on the podcast because, so we've been doing isolation tank. I'm so grateful to have been linked up with you and introduced to you by the wonderful Jennifer Sodini who brought us all together. And, um, I just, every time you always have something really interesting to say, that's also really novel to me. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know about Gene Gebser. I didn't know about, um, a lot of the things that you seem to have, uh, your, 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 your feet in. And, and I, f- I've always felt like, well, I, I, I thought, I thought I, I thought I knew about a lot of, uh, of these things in, in the peripheral, you know, maybe the, the thinkers that you kind of mentioned like CG young and, you know, those kinds of people, but Gebser is not, not so known, I suppose. No. And you're really bringing him to light and really expanding and expounding upon a lot of his, his work. Yeah, no, you're right that, um, Gebser's not really well known in the in the consciousness studies field or or, or world. Um, he's kind of like the best kept secret, you know, because when you do discover him and you dive into his work, it is like reading Jung. It is like reading um, some of the greats in terms of the heady tomes that have some profound insights into you know the nature of the psyche or the emergence of consciousness and so on. So, yeah, it's been fun to to reintroduce him. I don't know why like in terms of the timing, but it seems like his time has come just in terms of applicability to the current global crisis, planetary crisis. And then um, so much of what he talks about is just synchronistically linked to like John Verveke's work and kind of the, um, they're called the Emergencia by Brent Cooper. It's a really good article on uh, what is emerging, just an article series about like, different communities who are talking about sense making and new culture and transformations of consciousness, et cetera. And here's a guy back in like 1949, basically, um, who is writing about so much of these things that we're talking about and living through today. So the, the relevancy and prescience of his writing is just, it's difficult to understate, you know? Um, and that's something that I've been going through with my, uh, my class, like, we, we launched a, a basically a read-through class of Ever-Present Origin, which is Gebser's um, primary text in English, and it's one of his major works, major philosophical works. And, you know, the, the thing that happened during the class was COVID-19, right, and the, the quarantine and this global shutdown and the economic crash, and they're reading it, and, and they're kind of going like, Gebser's talking about what's what's happening in the world. So, and I couldn't have timed that better in, in that sense of just, you know, the, the timing of the class, the introduction of gaps or the publishing of the book. And now like kind of living the crisis at a new level where it's, it's difficult to, to ignore, right. It's difficult to really ask those really profound questions about like, how do we build our culture? Um, what are the different modes of, of sense making? And, uh, like I, I talk about it as cultural phenomenology, right? Like, what are our fundamentals of time, space, self, and world that we're operating with that have produced this crisis, right? Or have exacerbated it? And can we create a better one? Can we create a different one? Um, so that's kind of like the, the, the premise of Gebser's work, really. And then we, we could go into all of that. We can go into whatever you want <laughs> um, because we've had some good riffs already on on the isolation, like isolation tank with uh, Jennifer Sodini. So 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's like, I think well, as you're saying that I'm feeling that maybe it's because of Gebser's, um, felt sense of, of things like reading what you sent me, your work and looking into his, I'm getting a sense of this sort of new way of thinking about things, which doesn't rely necessarily on, um, you know, you can say it better than I can, but the, the way that I'm trying to understand it is really having a, a, a sense a feeling like I'm like these words keep coming up of this kind of the depth and breadth of the entirety and the totality of past, present and future as a whole. Yeah. You know, is, 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 so maybe you could expand on that a little bit in terms of kind of the mode of thinking that, that you're applying here and that Gebster is so well known for. Well, I think, um, you know, so the whole premise of his work and a lot of scholars who study the evolution of consciousness is that our assumptions about what the world is, right? Like what is time? What is space? What is matter? What is the self, right? And how do we relate to the world? Like those fundamental um, perceptions have transformed over time in history. Like the way in which we relate to the meaning. Uh, and I, I bring this up because tomorrow I'm going to be talking with them. Um, uh, Mark Vernon, who studied Owen Barfield's work, who, who also wrote about the evolution of consciousness. And he looked at language and he, and he goes, you know, pneuma meant something different to people like 2000 years ago. It meant spirit, but it also meant breath. And what is the kind of world, what does that kind of world look like where like spirit and breath are synonymous with one another? Like how did ancients organize their own perception in terms of like understanding the world more mythically, um, uh, living in a more enchanted and participatory cosmos. There was a different way of being and seeing, right? A different way of being in the world. And Gebser's overall work, it looks at that, at these fundamental like reworkings of, uh, of being in the world, right? And I, I'd say it's ontology, right? The nature mm -hmm. of being. But um, it also has to do with phenomenology and sort of what is our experience of being in the world? Um, what kind of senses do we orient around or uh, overemphasize in one culture over another. So all of these transformations have taken place. There's many different scholars who, who talk about them. And Gebser um, presents in his work a kind of overall unfolding of the history of consciousness. But what you're talking about is specifically when it comes to our crisis, right? Our moment in history right now, where we're moving away from what he called a kind of a, a lineal segmentation uh, in which we divide up reality through uh, what he called perspectival vision, right? Something that has been popular and has sort of overtaken our consciousness since the rise of modernity and the Renaissance and, you know, developing perspective in art and then developing the sciences, right? So much of that was oriented around like the eye and the perception of the eye, whether it's Leonardo da Vinci and developing perspective or it's lens crafters, right? Um, making telescopes, making microscopes, like everything is about this kind of perceiving eye that divides the world up into measurable space. And he says, that's over, right? We're, we're moving out of that. And the kind of civilization um, we're entering into, or more, more accurately, like the civilizational crisis we're in is as a result of this sort of mode of seeing that we have been running with for hundreds of years. It's sort of, been, it's spent itself out, right? And it's creating this crisis. And basically what he thinks is that there's this new intensity, right? There's this new perception that is emerging in consciousness that has more to do with time. And instead of it being all about the I and the perception of, of uh, the ego and the waking conscious self and the measurable world, it is now about uh, the sort of intensity of relations with one another, processes, temporics, uh, whether it's like temporics in terms of like uh, the unconscious, right? The past, the psychic past, or he's saying the future as well. So there's this kind of intense wholeness of time that he thinks is sort of pressing towards um, or demanding realization, right? It's kind of an intensity of consciousness and energy that is pressing towards realization and creating the crisis of modernity because we are not responding to it with the kind of equal intensity that it's asking us, right? Um, so that's sort of how he, he sort of structures the, the, the current moment. We have the civilizational breakdown on the one hand, and then we have all of these breakthroughs in terms of like 
new realizations of time and space. We've got quantum physics in the 20th century, breakthroughs in all of these different forms of art that are no longer interested in just depicting, you know, Renaissance style accuracy. They're interested in bringing out the soul or um, exploring different forms of time and space and self or or the non-human world. So there's this kind of breakthrough that's happening as the breakdown is happening at the same time. But it has to do with this wholeness of all of these different time forms. Um, and I, we can get into that too, because that b- moves into McLuhan and that moves into some spiritual conversations and everything else. But yes, it has to do with time. That's the, that's the kind of revolution. So in a sense, is this kind of progression of thinking, is this like a progression of thinking, you know, from sort of the archaic, to the magic, to the mythic, like, does it go in that linear way? And now we're at a, at a space where it's all being integrated or, or that it's thought of in this integral way in that, uh, a perspectival kind of place. Is that the, the term that we would use for that? Yeah. It's, and, it's, and is that yeah. correct? Is that like mm-hmm. a, is that linear progression through time correct? And now we find ourselves in this new kind of totality of time space. Mm. I would say it's relatively correct, right? Like for modernity, for the perspectival age, what Gepser called it the mental consciousness. There's these different structures that unfold. Um, The linearity of time, the sense of time having um, a definite past progressing into the future, right? Like we can measure what happened 50 years ago with the history books. We can look at that. We can look at geology and go, okay, here's a fossil from 50 million years ago. Like that's a kind of a sense of, spatial measurable reality that does have that linear sense it that is a reality what geps are saying is a little bit more a uh, little bit more nuanced or even pluralistic in that he's actually suggesting that the modes of time that our ancestors inhabited in terms of uh, rhythmic time or seasonal time or astrological time right with the different uh, the different progression of the archetypes across a season, right? There's a different God for every, you know, every star and, you know, the way in which those cyclical calendars worked, right? That universe is also real. He's saying like that has a validity to it. There is a reality to that mode of time and space. Um, there's a reality to the mode of magical timelessness. Um, there's a reality to the mode of mythical temporicity and rhythmicity in the cyclical time. And there's also a reality to linear time. So he's he's kind of going like, they're all real. They're all there. Right. They've unfolded in a certain way. Like we can talk about a process of um, uh, a consciousness unfoldment, right? Because we go from the magical to the mythical to the mental. So there is a sequence. Um, but for Gebster, he just doesn't really overemphasize it more than just uh, as a kind of an unfolding of something that's already latent in consciousness. Mm. Um, yeah. and well, the way in which they unfold is sort of discontinuous too. Um, they don't necessarily neatly integrate with one another or neatly progress from one to the, to the next. There's often like crisis, catastrophe, disequilibrium, loss, right? And then there's some new gain with the new mode of consciousness, but it's not like you're saying, it's like not really until we get to the integral that the whole can kind of be remediated again. Um, so that, that's sort of the, the nuanced answer to that. It's like, yes and no, like there is an unfoldment, but it's really messy. And, but yes, we do kind of get to this sense of, um, remediation and wholeness when we get to the integral structure. Um, hopefully, (laughs) hopefully. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like that. I mean, I think that I, I like yes and no, I like, I like paradox. (laughs) I think that that's, uh, I don't know any other way to, to sort of be, I feel, uneasy if I ever find myself uh, vehemently arguing a definitive uh, point mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, other than maybe like agnostic ambiguity for a lot of things. But um, you said something once in our isolation tank where I, I was saying, well, you know, it's 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 what we want to choose. You know, we get to this point in the future where we, we can see everything now and we get to choose. And you had said something like, well, and it wasn't a verbatim what you said, but you said something to in the extent of like, well, there's something that's kind of choosing us or there's something mm-hmm. that's emergent here that the, um, I think in your book, you talk about like making the, how do we make the, um, invisible visible, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so what, what, what is that thing 
(laughs) Is that like the question that theologians have been asking? (laughs) Right. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe, maybe it'd be better to ask like, what is your felt experience right now? And how is that guiding you in the, in this particular time and and place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, almost as difficult to answer because of, uh, trying to to verbalize the the felt experience but um to start with like when, when i was mentioning that in our isolation tank um like i was really trying to say that you know uh we very often take an anthropocentric stance that you know we're at this point in history where we can look back on everything and assemble things in a certain way and sort of understand things and and take this conscious step that it's all our conscious volition that's able to make some kind of evolutionary leap or, or cultural transformation and i think to some degree that is true volition is important but on the other hand that the flip side of it is that um this process that we partake in is also something that should be very humbling you know, it, it's the spiritual realities, uh, the nature of consciousness itself, the nature of our own consciousness, um, just studying the, the, the evolution and emergence of it. When you see these transformations take place, it's almost as if it's an event in nature, right? It seems to be happening to us. It doesn't necessarily, um, it's not necessarily um, instigated or, or fabricated by us. It's like an event that happens through us. And then volition kind of comes in when we kind of learn what it's all about and we start to participate in it. But I guess this is a big question mark for me. Like how much do we really, um, uh, really kind of initiate or master these forces of consciousness that seem to kind of emerge through us? We can respond to them, right? We have volition, we have ego, we have um, uh, self-reflexivity that are all very important but they're important in a in a sort of humbling way, right? Like, let's not overextend uh, our anthropocentrism, right, and say that we're on the evolutionary edge and we're all going to take this leap together because it's a it's a, there's a risk, you know. There's um there's a kind of a trust, uh, a spiritual trust in these forces that are unleashed through us. Um, and there's also like the other element of this too is like, um an artist, right. Who's working on, um, a a vision that they have, whether it's a book or a painting in in some ways, they're kind of possessed by that inner image, right. They, they're, they, the Greeks talked about the muse and the daemon. And, um, there's this sense that we, we are working with forces in us and through us, we're bringing them on into the world. Uh, so there's a cooperation that's always taking place, but how much we can take credit for what drops into, you know, the imagination. I don't know. You know, there, there's a kind of um, a working with something. What that something is, I don't know if we could really, really um, say without without kind of reducing it. You know, mm-hmm. but whatever that creative process of consciousness is that we've been partaking in in the history of, of our of our species, we participate in it. It participates in us. And so, like an event like this, it's just so interesting. Like we talked about this in one of the early the early tanks, right? Like that, um, an event like COVID-19, um, so much was already kind of stacked up as, as a, um, just ready f- to fall apart in a crisis, right? And there's so many systemic, cultural, institutional, structural issues that were just ready to fall apart. On the other hand, nobody could have necessarily predicted this event happening when it did, how it did, and what it would affect across the system as a kind of a, um, a complexity science question, right? All of the ripples, right? Um, the economic crash, et cetera. And so much has kind of fallen away as a result of this crisis, uh, just in terms of uh, stopping the economy for, for a minute, uh, having this sort of liminal fissure, right? Between what we were originally doing and now which has stopped and halted and now all of a sudden the new possibilities that might emerge out of this, right? economic, social, cultural, et cetera. Like it's not all positive, but it's almost as if this event, which is almost like an event of nature, uh, an event with a capital E, rips open new possibilities. There's a kind of dynamic intelligence in it that doesn't feel like it's just our intelligence, right? But maybe uh, in a Taoistic sense, uh, 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 something that happens in accordance to the way, right? There's a kind of a wisdom in in that event. 
And that's what I kind of mean too, is like right now so much has fallen away that actually might um, help to remediate different forms of time. Uh, I, I talked about this in, in one of my, uh, one of my podcasts, uh, that was a live stream, like this idea that, um, we're suddenly having not all of us, right. A lot of, a lot of essential workers out there who are still having to go and deliver food and everything else. But, um, a lot of us have had time to had time again, just period, just free time, leisure time, being stuck at home and introspection. It's been negative, but it's also been like the, the pace of modern life has suddenly been halted and we're suddenly having to fill time up with, uh, human centric activities again, even though we're isolated and we're craving community now, right? So there's, there's ways in which this event seems to have moved us back, uh, to a possibility of remediating things that we've lost in our culture, a human centric, uh, like kind of a common centric, a human centric, mutual aid centric, community centric culture. But I don't know if that will be substantiated in a couple of months and we might go right back, right? So, but there, there are ways in which um, things like this kind of happen of themselves. And that's what I'm kind of coming around, back around to. The crisis sort of has this innate intelligence in a way. And um, uh, it, it can teach us something, right? A crisis can become pedagogical. I, I borrowed that word from Michelle Bowen's uh pedagogical catastrophe where mm -hmm. like things fall apart and you learn a hell of a lot about yourself, about the world, about things that you have been doing, about things that you have not been doing. You know, there's an opportunity to reorganize around that and um, come out the better for it. And I'm hoping that happens in our culture. I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's really interesting because to have, I feel I feel that, and I'm going to say, I use the word feel intentionally because I mean it in this sense of understanding, but not being able to fully articulate the kind of uh, totality of the moment. But, you know, and I, I remember speaking to some people where I say, well, you know, every generation feels like they're at the end, like they're at the apocalypse, like things are going to hell. Like, but there is this kind of, felt sense, you know, to use that word again of like, something's happening here that's a beyond us, mm -hmm. that's bigger than us, that seems like it's a little out of our control. And yeah, I'm, I'm thinking like, there's a sort of um, this, this invitation to sort of surrender, and to let go a little bit and to listen a little bit more, that it seems that our the the sort of what we define as the progress of our civilization hasn't really been attuned to. So may, maybe this is a sort of a a, a built-in self-correcting sort of civilizational planetary thing that's happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, hey, even the, even Pope Francis was saying that uh, in a, in a matter of speaking, he was talking about, you know, we didn't, we didn't really respond to the climate crisis through the fires in Australia and, or, you know, this little disaster there, this little disaster here. So maybe this is, I think he called it the earth's response, right. Or, or the climate's response. And, um, it goes back to that topic we had about Gaia hypothesis. Um, this idea that, that the earth is, this is a very, you know, they're not moving into like Lovelock and Lynn Margulis are not making the kind of extensive claim that we might in the consciousness culture and go like, oh yeah, there's a spiritual nature to reality and events can kind of happen in, in this way. And there's a, like a deeper meaning to it, but they do nevertheless say that like, Hey, the planet functions like a self-regulating living system and it, it orients itself towards homeostasis and just brilliantly fascinating ways in which life has evolved to sort of maintain a certain level of, um, uh, certain fat, you know, certain CO2 levels in the atmosphere and heat, et cetera, et cetera. And it's able to maintain that. Um, and here comes human beings that disrupt all that and, oh, well, go figure. It is strange that, you know, the, the effect of this crisis has been a reduction in CO2 levels and pollution, um, the, the kind of uh, regulations and standards that we were kind of aiming for with the Paris Accord. It's, it's sort of just doing that of itself, you know, mm, it's like, all right, yeah. humans, you get you can't consciously do it. Then I will just, you know, 
I standing in for Gaia or the planet, just sort of going and doing it in its own way. Um, and, and that it's a kind of, it's a kind of, um, I don't know why I'm thinking of uh, Keats and negative capability, but it's like this, again, it, it's sort of an intelligence through catastrophe. It's, it's almost as like there's a self-organizing principle that's behind this work that actually gets to the effect that, you know, we've been talking about doing for, for decades now, just in terms of reducing pollution and reducing um, impact on the environment, et cetera. All, this crisis comes along and does that for us, you know, and it's this idea like, like Carl Jung talks about that, right. That um, if you don't consciously integrate something, if you're not aware of it, if you don't work it into your consciousness, it will be visited upon you, right. Mm. As a kind of a crisis or something that generates anxiety. And there right, seems to yeah. be some kind of intelligence or, or wisdom in that, in that insight here. And whether or not we literally believe that it is the planet in some kind of interesting uh, collective intelligence way responding to human beings and carbon emissions. I don't know if we can say that exactly. And yet the result is nevertheless, you know, right. where we are right now. So it's interesting. But you talked about like the um, the, the, the felt sense. And I, I, I know I mentioned that in my, um, my essay for the side view about like, the meta crisis and going meta, right? Like, there and, and I talk about it as a feeling, as a structure of feeling, and this is a term that um, the meta modernists talk about um, in academia. The meta modernists are basically like they're folks who basically are, are, are claiming that we're trying to describe the milieu that we're in, right? The intellectual cultural milieu where we're no longer really in modernity or even kind of post modernity. Civilization seems to be falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been climate disruptions, economic disruptions. We're, we're moving into a different culture, a different reality now, really. Like, and it's not globalization. It's not what we're doing in the 20th century. And it seems like some of the trends, again, of our civilization over the past few hundred years are coming to a stop or, or changing into something else. But we're not really sure what that is yet. So they call it this, it's a structure of feeling of kind of being in between two different realities of two different worlds. And I, I kind of use it in this essay to talk about um, exactly what we're all kind of feeling in the, in the COVID crisis, this sense that, you know, we're part of this planetary reality. And it might be a felt sense of anxiety about that, but it's still this kind of felt sense of the whole, right? We got all these crises stacking up on each other, the climate, the economic, right? Um, ecological, um, just justice crises, just in terms of, you know, can we create a more democratic society at a global scale? You know, there's all of these things that are exacerbated and coming to a head. And we kind of feel like there's a, a sense of the whole in all of this, a felt sense of the whole. And instead of like, for me anyway, instead of like going into meta theories that could explain everything, you know, here's a theory of everything that where everything fits in and uh, whether it's a conspiracy theory or uh, a cool philosophy, right? Um, rather than that, like let's let's flip that around and kind of get to the underlying structure of feeling that people have, because that's that's really where we kind of get the the um, for me anyway the more interesting insights into like what is going on in our culture right now, what is transforming, um, and it's like what you said is this the sense of the whole, the sense of whether or not it's consciously realized a, a planetary whole, right? A planetary humanity, even though it's, it's being experienced first as, as a catastrophe, as a disaster, as something that we're not um, living up to in a way, there's still that sense that it exists, right? It's asserting itself regardless of our uh, resistance to it or, even regardless of our idealism about it, right? Like we can live in subcultures and consciousness communities and talk about Gaia intelligence and um, planetary culture or going, you know, the whole world going green and renewable, you know. But there's a sense that even those visions and ideals are, are still orbiting around the reality of the planet. And the reality is something that escapes the maps. It escapes the, the, the concepts but we participate in it because we feel it, right? So I keep going back to that. It's it's a structure yeah. of feeling. And if we can hang on to that more than we can hang on to our maps, maybe we can actually 
be better informed by it, right? Maybe our maps can become more accurate. Maybe our projects towards this planetary humanity could become um, more resonant with the reality of planetary dynamics that, in that way. Um, does that make sense? It's kind of hard yeah, to articulate. No, it does. And and what I'm thinking of is is this kind of concretization of of these things rather than just the floating of them in the abstract and the theorizing about them and but actually kind of the the embodiment of them which you talk about. That that's kind of where my mind is going as you talk about these things and I know that you write about uh, how uh Gebser understood that this was like a breakdown sort of of our mental structure, right? Like the foundational mm -hmm. mental structure. And, um, <laughs> you know, this, this really, this new world that, that is like emerging, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, the, the sort of, um, I guess the mental structure is that like subject object dualism where there's this kind of separation, right. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, there's something else that is, that is fomenting or yeah, you know, yeah. fermenting at the top that that's that that's that's where that's where i'm kind of i i'm seeing things a little bit because it is uh i love like you know to, to, to explore all these realms but i think we've we've moved out of that is, is am i kind of going in the right direction with this because i'm 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 getting a sense that that's sort of where we're we're moving to is the sort of more embodied concrete uh feeling sense of, of mm -hmm. things now no you're totally uh you're totally on it uh th that's sort of what i was trying to articulate in that side view essay but in, in terms of gepser's work right like um the, if we were to take um a, a planetary story or, or, or kind of a, a narrative of humanity as an example um gepser or other thinkers and theorists like um cg jung's work is sort of about this individuation process where the self can really kind of emerge or evolve and uh, come to the forefront. But then we have to move beyond that, right? Charles Taylor talks about it as this process of the buffering of the self that our ancestors and different cultures have different relationships to self and world. Maybe it was more permeable. Maybe we had more access to the spirit realm. Maybe altered states used to be much more common. You know, in psychedelic culture, we talk about that all the time. Um, right, right. Ah, I just remembered why hmm. I brought that up too. It was from Maslow's hierarchy of not ending at the self-actualization like uh, top where many people think, but the actual kind of embodiment and action step hmm. comes hmm. after. Hmm. I'm not too familiar with that. Uh, with Maslow's hierarchy, uh, but but that sounds about right to me, just in terms of uh, what what I know with other theorists, in terms of like what Barfield talks about, or Gebser, or Charles Taylor, or um, you know Richard Tarnas is another great thinker who writes about archetypal history. Um, but there is this process of the, the forming of the self, uh, the the moving away of participation of collective participation uh, with these spiritual realities, imaginal realities, modes of thinking that are more symbolic and imaginal into more modes of thinking that are rational and self-reflective and spatial. Um, and the kind of the, the coalescing of the ego, right? Like the forming of the ego in the history of consciousness is very interesting just as a sort of a study. Um, in the popular show a few years ago, Westworld, it was all about that. Actually, they bring up uh, Julian James, who was a kind of a popular um, uh, researcher scientist in the 1970s who had this theory about the bicameral mind. But I bring him up because he talks about, and he's not the only one who does this, but he talks about the uses, the usage of I in ancient languages was um, much more rare. It took some time for I to show up, just the sense of I. And even in, in the, um, with Odysseus, and Gebser talks about this, Odysseus, when he wakes up on the shores uh, after, uh, I think, the shipwreck, uh, he, he proclaims, M. Odysseus. He doesn't say, I am Odysseus. He says, M. Odysseus. So there's this kind of latency of self-reflexivity that eventually emerges, um, but it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of this sort of um, enfolding in imaginal archetypal participation with the world. Like we've become estranged. Um, and part of this alienation process is individuation. But like, what do we do with after that, right? What do we do after the self and the ego, even a healthy ego is realized? Well, you know, 
in many ways for Gepser, it's it's about a reintegrating these other modes of participating in the world, these other structures of consciousness, um, and then B, uh, the only way to really do that is to supersede everything that has been achieved already in, in the history of consciousness into, into this new, what he called the integral consciousness, where he calls it the suprapersonal, um, which is similar to what Teilhard de Chardin describes too, the suprapersonal in terms of you have an ego, but you've overcome it. The ego has become transparent. It's a spiritual process. Um, so I, I know you hear my cat. I don't know if I should let her out or not. Oh, yeah. Do whatever you like. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One second. Yeah, no problem. What, what's, what's your cat's name? Sophie. Ah, uh, Sophie I've got cat. two cats, Sophie and Brasha. Sophie's a little nice. ragdoll. Oh, Brasha's a unique name. Mm-hmm. Funny enough, uh, that that just came with came with her when we adopted her. She was just Brasha on the uh, at the adoption center. So I was like that. I like that name. That's a unique name. Yeah, yeah. We, just, cool. we kept we kept it. She's a, she's a black cat, and Sophie's a white fluffy ragdoll cat. Um, nice. very very vocal. And she was napping here, and I thought she would nap for the adoration of her podcast, but no. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, no problem. Where were we? The uh, coming of the self. Yes, the after the individuation of the ego. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is this is a very interesting, just in terms of the the only way to really understand where we are is to understand how we got here, right? Like what is the process of awakening consciousness? And that's what Gepser is trying to articulate in his work. Um, it's not just an abstract thing. You know, like we, to understand the emergence of the ego is also to understand like, oh, well, there are other, you know, um, earlier modes of consciousness that were different from that, right? Like I take it for granted that I'm this waking, spatial thinking um, individual, right. With an interior life and I'm going around the world trying to, uh, do what I want to do in the world. Right. But then there are these other forces that are at work in that, like literally the word person means to sound through. And it literally meant persona means for a God or an archetype to sound through the self. So our, our even our definition of self has gone through these mutations in history. Um, and so, you know, in terms of where we are today, the challenge is, is how can we overcome a rigidified ego, right? Overcome this um, rigidified and in, in some sense, static sense of self, right? Where the world has become increasingly materialistic. Our thinking has become increasingly fragmented and, and narrow and uh, uh, sectorized, to mm. a great extent, you know, there's so many, there's this discussion online about the culture wars, right? Everyone is, has their own little mimetic tribe and they're all arguing with one another. And the apparatus of the internet is a great way to completely insulate yourself and right. And just go to go on these, um, these attack campaigns against other tribes. Like you want to believe the earth is flat. There's websites, there's podcasts, there's whole media ecosystems where you can totally uh, envelop yourself in that. So is there, there's this sense for Gepser anyway, that the achievement of mental consciousness of the waking ego and the spatial self has uh, in a sense undone itself eventually, right? That narrow sectoring of, of the perspectival vision has made it so that everybody has their own totalizing little reality and there's no more connecting tissue in terms of humanity, in terms of the whole in terms of the spiritual. And so this is kind of like what Verveke talks about with the meaning crisis, that we're, we're kind of disconnected from, from the depths of our own past. But then what we have left is not really something that can take us into the future either, right? So mm. there's a sense we have to overcome this. And and Gebser was writing about this in, in the 40s? Like he, he saw this coming? Yeah, well, I think, you know, he's, Gebser was, um, he was a poet and um, I think he, he just had a very deep sensitivity to 
what works of art we're doing, mm. um, what the, the mode. And, and sure, it could be interpretive. Like, sure, he could just be like his own very creative, intelligent readings of works of art. But what he was drawing from, like looking at Renaissance painting, looking at the history of art and the history of consciousness, he was going, yeah, yeah, this is this is the mode of quote unquote sense making that the West has been really good at, but here's also where it leads in terms of if we don't, if we one-sidedly emphasize this directional oriented spatial self, it ends up in this very narrow tunnel vision. It ends up in hyper fragmentation. And he saw this as sort of a, a process that had been escalating since, um, let's just say the 1400s or 1500s, like, um, the, the Protestant reformation fragmented the sort of Catholicism of, of Western, uh, Western Europe, right. Into thousands of different denominations, all fighting with one another. Um, hyper specialization of knowledge was already starting in, in the 20th century in terms of the scientific domain. So he, he saw it as something that was happening, over the course of many centuries and was really intensifying in the 20th century um, and was embodied in something like the atomic bomb where it was ultimately like the ultimate way to divide is to just divide matter itself up, right? To just cut the, the very basis of uh, the rational Western world, the scientific world, which was, was, was the atom bomb, kind of the symbol of the apotheosis of reason, right? of ratio, which means to wow. divide. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he, he, he saw it as like, you know, the, the, the Plato called it diuresis, right? The hair splitting. Um, so there's this the capacity in human consciousness to divide, to think, to intellectually cut things up and measure. And I don't just mean just like in terms of systematizing, but just thinking reflexivity, philosophy, intellect is great, great tools, great capacities. But when we overextend that, when we one-sidedly privilege that over these other modes of consciousness that I think in the psychedelic community and the consciousness culture, we're more familiar with those. I think we've seen a return of those in the last century. But if we're so one-sidedly ignoring those domains and only orienting towards progress, reason, positivism, et cetera, we end up with the kind of world and the momentum of that world that we're still living in today. And so, um, yeah, long story short, but that's sort of the answer. Like, yeah, he did in the forties because, you know, the mode of consciousness everyone has been operating in hasn't fundamentally changed, right? Like here we are in the 21st century, but you know, we're still using, um, systems of government modes of thinking, extractive economic and, and, and ecological policies that are still in that kind of, the world is an object. I am the subject. I want to extract something from it and, and cut it up for my own benefit, right? Um, capitalism is sort of the, just a, as an ideology, it's, it's the same kind of mode of time and space, linear, infinite growth. Let's, it, let's find new markets. Let's, let's, let's open up the world for um, greater and greater capital gain. Every year has got to be better than the last. So there's this kind of one-sidedness to consciousness that Gepser saw as this crisis. Um, so when we talk about like the climate crisis and COVID-19 and the epidemic and the uh, economic crisis right now, they're all related to this sort of mode or structure of our civilization that has been operating for the past you know, few hundred years. And then if you look at a, a scholar like Gepser, um, he's not only talking about our civilization, he's talking about, well, it, that, that is part of the history of consciousness unfoldment, right? We've been, we've, we've worked and mastered the mental structure and it's coming undone. So mm -hmm. it, 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 it contextualizes our civilization and this crisis in this longer story of unfoldment, right? In this longer kind of emergence and awakening of, of, of human consciousness. And I think that can be like, helpful, you know, to some degree to kind of feel like, okay, there's, we're part of this greater process of unfolding, right? And even though it feels very difficult right now. Right. Um, and understanding some of these questions in terms of like our civilization's phenomenology and ontology in terms of like how we sense make, how we organize, like I've been talking about, um, 
getting that gives some coherence to the complexity of the problems too, right? Like we got the meme wars here. We got capitalism as a problem here. We got, um, you know, the left and the right fighting it out over here. Um, it gives a better sense of the whole, actually. It actually gives us better coherence. And that's really important right now in terms of navigating everything that's going on because it's so overwhelming, right? There's just so much to take in. Um, so I found it very, very helpful and clarifying in this sense. Yeah, and it, it, and it almost like, gives what this sort of mutation, I guess, right? Which is also the name of your podcast, Mutations, um, which it's sort of this breakdown or natural unfolding or dissolvement of, of, of this civilizational uh, structure um, almost kind of like births a sort of meaning crisis as well for individuals to say, well, th these, these modes are sort of becoming obsolete. They're no longer serving us anymore. And then maybe there's this sort of fragmentation to find meaning in these tribes and, and what emerges from that? Is that, is that sort of, um, is that sort of the, the, the result of, of what happens is that we, we get a sense maybe that, you know, like we, you were, I think, uh, I don't know if we mentioned David Graeber on, on here, but you were, you referred to him in the discord and I've read a couple of his things and where he, he had, you know, he had this great essay that then turned into a book of bullshit jobs. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, we're, we're all sort of now trying to find this meaning amongst the chaos, right? Yeah. Um, I think part of that is, uh, first of all, it's a great book. And, um, the, the book I was referencing was uh, Fragments of a Anarchist Anthropology. Yeah. Uh, which is a, yeah. It's a great little, like, it's basically a little essay, a little sliver of a book. But um, yes, I, I think part of Graeber's excellence, right, is this sort of looking at um, global capital culture, right, in the business organizational world like an anthropologist would and going like, well, why do we, you know, why do we create these sort of meaningless jobs? Like there's a kind of, um, uh, 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 I don't want to say a bureaucracy. It's sort of a baroqueness of, uh, paper pushers, right. And managers for managers for managers, but there's almost something culturally stylistic about that. Like it doesn't really make sense. So why do we do that? You know? Um, and he, he kind of ties it around to certain economic ideologies um, in, in terms of like reinforcing the need for bureaucracy and capitalism. Um, and that a lot of this bloat comes from uh, the corporate private sector, not the public, you know, we're, we're, the, the kind of narrative that like, oh, bureaucracy bloat only comes from the government. He completely dispels that in this book. Um but in terms of like the meaning crisis, yeah, I think um, I would, I'm just thinking actually of a, a book that just came out by Michael Brooks called uh, Against the Web, uh, a cosmopolitan answer to the new right. But it ends it ends as a, um, a kind of a meditation on freedom. And what he says is like what we're really for, like, you know, the whole the left has sort of been defined as anti-capitalist. Right. But what what it's really for is just freedom to create a meaningful life. Right. Um, so much of the work that we do is out of our own compulsion for subsistence and survival. Like, you know, maybe we don't have to worry about Huns or Vikings attacking us, you know, being protected by our feudal lords, but we still are forced to do a lot of work that we don't necessarily want to do, right? The, the freedom for work, not to be, um, restricted to certain things, but to live in our own capacity, right? We don't live in that culture, right? We, we've been dehumanized. And that's what like Marx meant about like alienation from labor. Like it's your cog in the machine in a factory or et cetera, et cetera. So like, how can we create meaningful work and meaningful participation in, in society? Um, the, the alienation that's taken place, I think it, it, it is part of what Gebser talks about, this perspectival world. Um, that has a kind of economic ideology that is highly extractive and objectifying, right? It quantifies everything. It wants to measure everything. Um, it's that famous quote, um, you know, to the eye, everything measurable, you know, and everything that is me not measurable will eventually be measurable. There's this kind of 
ultimate quantification of the human being in, in this culture, in this society that, um, not only the left, but just this spiritual counterculture is railing against, you know, um, the, the latest season of Westworld is exploring that too, actually, but, um, we don't have to dive too deeply into that, but it, it is exploring that question of like, okay, what happens if like, you know, AI figures out, um, the algorithm behind everybody and is able to kind of predict your life and like right. plot a course for you, like is freedom important, you know? Um, and, and is there a kind of a, a loss of your own capacity to try to break your own patterns? Right. So like all of these questions are coming up, I think, especially right now as digital capitalism is, you know, exponentially growing and we're dealing with this problem of like, okay, can we have freedom for our own self-expression, our own, subjectivity or are we ultimately just measurable cogs in a machine right the machine right. of capital and that's the question graber is always asking in all of his work you know can can there be some liminal zone in which we can seize an opening for this new freedom this different kind of world um and and, and, and to tie it back to gepser um you know, that's the a perspectival world, right? That's the integral world that he's talking about. It's a world that is characteristically defined by that freedom, that openness, uh, not only spiritually, but also is it possible that that spirit could influence the political as well or the economic? Like, what would that actually look like on the ground and live life? Um, yeah, I don't know, Jeremy. Sounds like a lot of work. Sounds like I have to participate more in that world, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's the problem with it, right? Um, you you inherit more freedom, but then you also have to participate in that freedom, you know, right. in order to keep it, in order to be in it. So, but we all get to kind of uh, have a little lever of the directionality of of of. Uh, creating more meaning for ourselves. I think mm -hmm. when we, when we have a more participatory world where we're free, frees up the, our cognitive processes to think about things and what we want to do and what we want to contribute. Right. And exactly. so, but there's bit that the sort of, um, there's this allure that everything is going to be taken care of and systematized and everything's going to be efficient mm -hmm. and seamless. Right. Yeah. That's the date. Like, the Silicon Valley kind of uh -huh. tech bro, you know, utopian thinking. Right. It's kind of a, like a managerial classes utopia, right? Like, okay, let's, let's systematize everything and end up kind of breaking through into, you know, just completely controlling the world, right? Completely dominating the world. Yeah. I just think there's, there's, um, there's a principle of what Geps are saying in, in a lot of the social democratic movements that are kind of erupting around the planet right now, whether, uh, we're talking about like Richard Wolf and what he's talking about in terms of, um, democratizing, uh, the corporate space, democratizing the workspace. Can we participate more and have more freedom in that space? Because right now it's actually the most undemocratic domain of modern life, right right we all right. believe in freedom but when it comes to money in the private sector you know everyone has little fiefdoms essentially right yeah. where your 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 livelihood your health is at risk like if you don't please your boss in the right way you know um even if you're a good worker so there's a sense that you know uh, our and, and, and real quick, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I just want to comment on that as many people take this no, as a notion of, of progress, like, well, you, you get to choose whatever job you want and you get to earn your own income and you have this kind of autonomy, but it's not really that way. Yeah. And, and, and Gebser is questioning this whole thing. Like this is what he's all about too, right? Is questioning this, 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 what we determine, I guess, as a measurement of progress and autonomy and freedom. Well, yeah, exactly. And that's um, to kind of bring it back to the theme of time, right? And how Gebser is very interested in, um, you know, understanding culturally what our relationship to time is and why it produces so much anxiety in the modern world. And there's this like, just a billion times used phrase, right? Time is money, or I have no time right? That statement, there's so much implicated in that. First of all, time is money, right? Time is quantified, right? Time is, is again, the ratio, the measuring of time is, is an attempt to master uh, 
the dimension of time to master uh, reality, right? In that sense of, uh, okay, well, clock time. Uh, it's positivistic. It goes forward. We can measure it. We can master it, right? And things are getting better and better and better. Um, there's that. But then there's also the capitalist version of that, which is, yeah, things are getting richer and richer and richer. We're going to extract more wealth. You know, next year's gains are going to be better than last year's. We'll find more things to quantify and measure and extract. Um, so time is money. And then also the idea that I have no time. And Gebser talks a lot about this as, as something that we haven't really reckoned with. And we haven't even really rec reckoned with it today in the sense that um, for him, time almost emerges in modernity uh, in the 1700s as a cultural phenomenon that begins to intensify in pressure and concern and anxiety for the West. And he says specifically two, two, two places it emerges. The first is... Um, it emerges in what he calls uh, the, the awakening of the left, right? The awakening of the left to itself um, and the sense of history kind of progressing to become better in terms of the, the leftist projects since the French Revolution. And then in the 1780s, the invention of the steam engine with James Watt. Mm. He says these are two almost synchronic events historically in our culture that correspond to this theme of time. He calls it time eruption. And with the, with the steam engine specifically, he's talking about the industrial revolution, the invention of the machine in the machine world. So he's saying, you know, on the one hand, we have the eruption of technology in the machine world. And on the other, we have this awakening of history in the left. And both of these forces continue to intensify, whether we're talking about the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, and the series of revolutions that start to happen in the, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and then in the 20th century, we get even more of a, an intensity of the machine, just in terms of, um, you know, you can look at the Italian futurists in the early uh, 20s and 30s. Um, their paintings express this perfectly, right? They're um, really kind of dazzling depictions of the machine world or of like cities that are just exploding up into space, right? Um, uh, machines that are racing forward and tanks. And they, ha they had a kind of a glory of time as this racing forward. So it really kind of comes to the forefront in the 20th century. Um, but when we say we have no time, what we're really saying is time is this intensity that is that, that seems to have um, gone out of our control, just like technology, just like the industrial world, just like capitalism, right? Like Everybody knows it's not really that good, but nobody really wants to stop it. We can't really imagine doing anything else. Like, um, uh, right. Or the only other thing that we could imagine would be something else that's already been imagined, like socialism mm -hmm. or communism. Right. Some other and, ism. And we know. believe, oh, those have failed. So really the only thing is is capitalism, right? Um, who is it? Was it Frederick Jameson who said it's easier to, to uh, imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism? Mm. Um but then it's also Le Guin said, who said, right, like we, we used to have the divine right of kings. Now we don't. We, we can imagine out of capitalism. But uh, the point is here that um, time as a theme in Western culture and now in global civilization has become this intensifying sense of anxiety of something that has gone out of our control. And for Gebser, there's a reason for that. Um, the spatial measurable perspectival world is not equipped to understand the nature of time and therefore not understand the nature of life, right? It can only quantify, it can only measure, it can only have that subject object, object relationality, that dualism. It approaches its, its whole civilizational apparatus that way. And so in a certain way, it's almost as if like time as a, as a fundamental function of, of, or dimension of reality is kind of challenging that, right? It's like, oh, okay, so I'm clock time then, great. So let's go faster. Oh, I am motoricity then, right? I, I, you can master time with the machine. Okay, let's overwhelm you with the machine world, right? Okay, time is infinite linear growth. Great, let's go so fast that, you know, you're going to be barreling towards uh, the Anthropocene disaster in our century. Um, so there's a sense that it it, we are not in control of it. Our relationship to time is impotence. It's, it's uh, as he says, it's emancipated from the hand, ex manu both the left and the machine world, right? Technology. So again, to come back to this sense of I have no time, 
what we're really saying is like, I, I don't understand time. I don't, I don't understand myself. I don't understand this integral function of the world. Um, but it also, the other side of that is I have no soul when I say I have no time. Because as we've been saying, if we only believe in the rational measurable world, the immeasurable world of the soul, of consciousness, of the psyche, right? Of these older forms of, of reality that we used to be more in touch with, those go away too, right? That's part of what's severed too by this meaning crisis. So, you know, there is this sense that we only have in 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 the immediate um, no, no living time in terms of the soul. And then also no potential future, like a real future, like a real creative possibility outside of this culture we've created. So there's this only this flat now, which is in the middle of a crisis, right? Like William Gibson says, there is no sense of the future. There's only a now that's like crisis management. Um, and there's a sense of the speeding up of time. And I mm -hmm. think we feel that today. That's a felt sense, right? Like yeah. bureaucracy. We, we don't, we know we're, what we're doing isn't working. Um, but nobody really feels like they can slow anything down anymore, right? Like, uh, you know, the power of Accord, even sticking to it by some scientist measurements uh, wouldn't be enough to avert, you know, some major climate disruptions in this century. So, yeah, there's a sense that we are out of control, right? We've unleashed forces that are out of our control. And for Gepser, those forces have to do with this new integral reality, this new intensification of consciousness. And the more that we approach that new reality through um, this old world and its old forms of sense making, the more that new reality breaks apart that old world, it, it rips it open. It causes a catastrophe, right? It causes a, sort of an intensification of crisis. And that also kind of feels like when I read that for the first time, that really feels like what's going on in this world right yeah. now. There's a felt sense of like, oh, that's true. You know, we, we are not approaching um, reality in as integral a way as we could be. And that might be playing into why uh, the, 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 the negative manifestations of this new world are so intense right now, because we're kind of coming at it in a very unenlightened way, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And you brought up um, art. And you bring that up a lot in uh, aesthetics, and and uh, you know, Gebser talks about you know, and he's he was a poet, and the, the value of that. I'm wondering where sort of uh, altered states or psychedelic states play into um, play into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what's funny? Um, Gebser was this is where he was a man of the 1940s. He wasn't a big fan of any of that, and that wasn't even really on his radar. Um, but for him, like, I'll give a generous reading and interpretation as somebody in the in the 21st century of his work. And what he says, you know, part of the process of, of actually um, making this mutation is reintegrating these other modes of consciousness. And I think as moderns, we, it would be fine for us to go into and to cultivate liminal states. You know, I think it's very actually significant for us to do that and remediate that process. I think maybe our ancestors lived in that more, you know, they were, had the capacity to access liminality and these altered states in a more ready, ready-made accessible way. But for us, I think, you know, a, a lot of people have said this in the consciousness culture, like um, maybe it requires us to really break down those doors, you know, or break open the head as, as Pinchbeck described, right. breaking right. open the head. Um, that resonates with me in that sense, right? Like that, you know, our culture is so one-sidedly against all of that, that it might require that intensity to break through and to break in, right? So that being said, I think a big part of um, uh, handling this responsibly is, is, is also the integration because anything that has been repressed or, um, uh, cut off or severed from that's a part of us is going to show up in a very intense way and break through it, right? As a kind of repressed, repressed energy. Um, but that also runs the danger of um, being destructive. So I think integration and integration around psychedelics into life, right? Um, as healing modalities, um, as something that doesn't threaten to undo, you know, the waking ego, right? We don't want to destroy the self. We want to integrate 
with liminality and the capacity for liminality. So integration, I think, is really important for, for psychedelic culture. But I understand why it's sort of been a, like a flood of interest, right? Because we've been so neglecting these dimensions of our being. Um, and I think it's also a good way, like uh, it's, it, it's potentially a good practice in terms of in, integral consciousness um, to get familiar with uh, being in a state of, of ego dissolution, right? If only temporary, um, or going through these healing processes and working with these psychic realities. Um, we're so starved for that, that I think it would be very good to um, learn about it again and um, just just be literate with it again, you know? Just these are, um, like Gebser would say, you know, the magic and the mythic, they're more psychic oriented. They're more oriented towards the invisible, we need to bring that back somehow, you know, we really mm -hmm. need to find how, to, how that is already and already has been a part of our being and um, bring that into modern life, quote unquote, right? Not modernize it, but just render it present. And that's the practice of um, integrality is a kind of a contemplative work of bringing into presence all of these different modes of consciousness so that they're accessible to us um, they have their own appropriate expression, their own appropriate relation to the whole. And so liminality is part of that, you know, and uh, altered states are part of that for, for sure. Um, so that's sort of my like tentative answer. It's like, yes, psychedelics, but let's also not overdo it. And I think, you know, in psychedelic culture, that can be kind of the other side, right? The over exaggeration of something that has been repressed, understandably mm -hmm. so, you know? Yeah. Um, so I guess I take a more of a, a contemplative Buddhist approach, right? Like uh, not against it. It's just like, it, it's part of it, but we got to have equanimity, right? There has to be kind of a poise as we reintegrate everything uh, and also compassion for when we don't, you know, because uh, this is a healing process, right? Um, and again, so much of what uh, the rich history of our consciousness has been, um, severed from us in terms of meaning, in terms of um, indigeneity for many moderns, you know. So it's going to be a long process. Um, it's very humbling work. <laughs> so, <to speak. laughs> yeah. What does that look like to you? Um, what does the future look like? Like you, you, you say it's it's going to be a long process, you know. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in in sort of thinking uh, or knowing a little bit about. Uh, I don't know, I guess maybe like an ideal version yeah. and the, or I mean, whatever version you want to put forward, whether it's the yeah. kind of realistic practical version or, you know, but I get a sense, I get a sense from you of like, there's hope, like there's, it's not like we're going to be, be slaves to robots and toiling underground for extracting resources. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Um, yeah. But yeah, like, um, for me, like it's, I'll be more descriptive uh, than than prescriptive about what I hope for because I do see the trends are already kind of happening. Um, and I, what I would like to see and what I do see already starting is is um, uh, a, a uniting of different fronts in terms of overcoming this civilizational crisis, like um, working with post-capitalist economic systems and activists who are allying with indigenous rights activists and indigenous communities that in some sense can lead the way in terms of like, how do we work with the planet? How do we work with the earth? So in many ways, it kind of looks like a reversal, right? That like the, the indigenous communities that have been, um, kind of seen as, as, as the, the furthest from progress by our, by modernity become, um, the, the center, you know, or the root of where we need to be kind of allying with and who we need to be allying with. So I see this as like a coming back down. Like I use this phrase a lot from Bruno Latour. Um, but he, he it's a book he called, uh, down to earth in the process of coming down to earth modernity and our civilization has been so, abstract oriented so direction oriented that i think you know in terms of a process reversal is is being asked for right um coming back down moving from abstraction to embodiment um, moving from an abstract totalizing sense of the global 
economy to um, a, a, you know, an immediate bioregional focus even. Just like how do we work with the land? How do communities that are completely based off of, you know, extractive um, industries uh, learn to relocalize? And that's something we talked about in the isolation tank, like, yeah, uh, people are talking about like, how do I bake bread? Uh, where do I get bread if if I if I can't get it from my supermarket or the baker? Um, should I grow my own wheat? You know, my friend was just asking that. Like, maybe I can grow my own wheat. I don't know. Maybe I'll need a lot of land for that. So there's this question now of like, where do we get our food from, our sustenance, our resources, and how can we build a more resilient localized economy? tapped into the global, right? Tapped into the planetary in solidarity with mutual efforts around the planet to overcome uh, this crisis of capitalism and crisis of, you know, modernity in terms of the the, the operating system of the civilization. So there's a sense that it, it is planetary in the need to work together and learn from each other. And it is profoundly local in a way that, that, we have not known s- since before industrialization, but we're going to rediscover it in a new way. And I like that vision. Um, I think it's 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 a greener world. You know, it's a world where we've come down into the local. It's not a utopian, abstract vision, right? Of like um, an ideal society where we're all kind of moving towards. It's like it's sort of based on well, how do we feed people? Um, how do we help out help out our neighbors? How do we work with the land and the planet that we're on in the very specific, like the, the ecology of where I am right now in Tampa Bay and like, you know, the West coast of Florida um, or wherever we find ourselves. So the bioregional coming down to earth, um, planetary localism that Michelle Bowens has this word cosmo localism. I think this is, this is kind of a hint of the future that is being demanded of us through this crisis. Um, it's, it's sort of the, again, we talked earlier about like the way in which there's a sort of a natural inclination of things, of the whole to be going in a certain way. And I think what has arisen from this crisis is the need for that kind of cosmo localism to start emerging just in terms of like for a survival, right? For a resilience. These are not things that people are asking because they want to be green utopians. They're going like, I was a suburbanite and now I don't know, maybe I need to grow my own food. And oh, okay, somebody's starting a cooperative commons farm, you know, in the neighborhood and I need to get involved because I want my kids to make sure that, you know. So there's all this reshifting towards the local in a very new way. And um, in terms of like, like as as Latour says, the 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 arc of modernity that has tried to achieve um, a, a planetary civilization through this trajectory of globalization, opening up markets, using capitalism, um, monocropping, right? That doesn't work. That we have to find another way to the global, right? And. I've playfully used this as a, as a distinction. We have globalization on the one hand, all these definitions we've just used, but planetization is more of what we're talking about, right? That is mm. deeply bioregional, working with indigenous living communities, like working with living processes of the planet and basing our economy off, off of that, right? Again, not as an ideal principle, but as, you know, as we're seeing around us, like the other way doesn't work. The other way is a fiction. You know, the way we've been operating our civilization is less real than what we're coming down to now in terms of relocalizing, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a kind of reversal of of what we have once considered utopian and then what we have once considered just like the the bare material economic reality of capitalism. Like, oh, we gotta just we gotta just work with it, you know, it's just the it's just the material basis of things. Um, that material basis is evaporating quickly in this century. So the quicker we can reprioritize these new values, I think uh, the better off we'll be, to be honest. Um, so that's sort of a middle way. It's like kind of hopeful, but I know things are dire at the same time. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I agree with you. I think like a hundred percent there. Like I, I loved what you, what you just said. And, and I think I'm on the same page and, uh, and it's, and it's bringing up for me this also really uh, no, felt sense again to get back to that kind of term where in this crisis that that is it's not about this sort of grandiose abstract you know uh, 
um, utopian kind of vision. It's more about like, hey, like what's really important here, and and what are the tools and skills that we all have uh, developed now, and the technologies to kind of utilize that. And as um, you know, like Doug, Douglas Rushkoff says, like making things you know work for us. Uh, not us work for them, you know, that kind of the team human sort of uh, mm -hmm. uh, approach to taking the the tools and the technologies and and bringing it into this localized kind of vision that's also, as you said, this kind of planetary, what was it, the word you used? I loved it. Oh, the planetization? The planetization, yeah. That's yeah, just, that's that seems so much more real. Mm -hmm. That's a Tehardian word, uh, the Jesuit uh, theologian um, Tehard de Chardin. He he's the guy who popularized the noosphere. Oh, um, yeah. I didn't know that. And uh, yeah, he he was um, mid century guy. He died in the nineteen sixties, I think, or late fifties. Um, but uh, he was a Jesuit priest who wrote the Phenomenon of Man. He, he published a number of works. And uh, actually, during his lifetime, he was censored by the Catholic Church. They told him he couldn't publish his work. Um, it had to be published posthumously. Uh, so he wasn't really known while he was alive, but when he passed and all of his works got published, uh, there was this kind of weird, um, Tehardian moment in the fifties and sixties. And he was sort of part of the counterculture. He inspired Marshall McLuhan. He even inspired like, um, the Flannery O'Connor, uh, the, a famous Catholic, uh, literary writer, um, but many, many other thinkers. And yeah, he had this vision. He called it um, well, he had a vision of the evolution of consciousness, first of all, but um, planetization for him, he saw as this kind of process in which um, human beings were weaving themselves together in, you know, a, kind of a global mind, right? A, a global consciousness. And it wouldn't be like he talked about as well, like Epser does, this like supra personal, supra individual or like just like the, the the cells in a body, like individuals would come together in this like greater unifying spirit. Um, and he was a Catholic. So he had this vision of, um, uh, he calls it the Omega, right? This sort of, he tried to not secularize it exactly, but make it more palatable to non-Catholics. But he believed that there was this kind of spirit of the planet. Everyone was coming together in this, in this sense of, um, love and and uh interdependence and um he has a very interesting way of thinking about things but i love that word planetization yeah. um it's it's a it's it's a process you know and um for him like he was he was a deep optimist like everything that happened in the 20th century uh, different than gepster you know he was like oh world war one whatever you know you know what we're we're more unified because of that afterwards world war ii same thing you know all these global trade rounds have gotten instantiated so you know humanity despite ourselves we, we're coming together we can't stop this process um and i think that's it, it's a good it's a good way of flipping it around you know in terms of staying with the positive um but planetization for me is like it, it it is not globalization right it's something that really is working with reality and in the same way that like renaissance artists were like discovering space and discovering perspective in the measurable world and kind of waking up from uh you know the more enclosed medieval um uh, imagination of like you know uh it wasn't as spatially oriented. They were, the cosmos were enclosed in like the heavenly spheres and everything was kind of um, oriented around the Bible and around this kind of archetypal imagery of Christianity. Like the, the Renaissance kind of blew open the lid into this new reality of space. And I think we're kind of doing the same thing right now, um, but in another way, right? We're, we're kind of waking up to the reality of like living processes of the planet right mm. is that is that where our orientation is you think like right yes now? yeah I, I would say like this is the, the that structure of feeling right like because everything we're talking about is like oh modernization was based off of that like duality of subject and object and extractive capital etc Th those are all fictions like we're coming crashing down into this in, into a new ground but the new ground is not static like you know the perspectival renaissance spaces it's dynamic it's alive it's mm -hmm. it's again oriented around time and process living systems and it's a very complex reality it's a very dynamic reality and you know we're learning that oh we have to 
master that. You know, we have to build civilization in response to that, just like we did around the Renaissance. Like we reoriented everything. And we're, we're seeing that restructuring happening right now. But of course, in these periods is profoundly destabilizing, right? Because the, the old ground, we're still kind of stepping on it as it's falling apart. And we got one foot in this new reality. And it's sort of hard to get to get a sense of like, what we're really bringing with us into the new culture and what we need to leave behind. Right. Mm, and yeah. um, in between the, the space in between. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. Like, uh, like Gepster called it. Uh, he says, we, we lived in a, Jan- we live in a Janus faced age, right? We were looking back and we're looking forward. Uh, we're in an interim space, a liminal space in and of itself. So, you know, any, any way to help us navigate that is, and get a sen- a felt sense of where that new footing is, is really important right now. You know, just like if you can feel it, not necessarily think about it or articulate it philosophically, but if you can feel it, you know, that's, that's something, you know, and I think for many people, they don't feel that yet, or they'll, they only feel that as the negative, you know, as a kind of like a falling apart. So, what I'm trying to do, and I think a lot of us in the consciousness culture are trying to do is like, hey, you know, that there there is this new ground. It's a very dynamic ground. And it's very different. But our entire world is reorganizing around it. So if we can get cohered about that, then it just frees up so much more energy and creativity and innovation towards it. You know, just like we saw during the Renaissance, just like we saw during any of these major civilizational leaps, um, there's this sort of dynamic, liberating capacity when somebody really kind of breaks into that new reality and reorganizes themselves around it there's just so much more energy and creativity that's freed up for it and we can personally achieve that like that's that's the one thing like i want to bring in um if more than anything else right like if we can overcome this crisis in ourselves like that that is is just so important you know just to be able to say like we've overcome this interim age, at least in the spirit, right? And we're present for the world and we're present for the new world. If more of us can do that, then, you know, we can create that culture. And I guess that's the only utopian thing that I'm saying is like, I want us to do that. You know, I, I would like there to be more coherence and energy and clarity in, in terms of what's emerging. So yeah, in my totally. work, that's what I try to do. So. Yeah, and it 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 reminds me just because I'm so involved with with psychedelics that that kind of psychedelic experience of you know having that sort of fear a little bit about surrendering to the unknown to the diverse novel um, you know complexity of of what you're going to be thrust into and but want like wanting to hang on to that the the old stories the old identities but knowing that it's not serving you anymore. You need to totally shatter those things. And that in between space that, um, uh, you know, that, that I can't, the words escaping me right now, but like that space where you, you're going to be hurled into the abyss is the, is the space that you sort of need to like trust that that's where you need to go. Um, you know, in, in some capacity or the other. So, you know, magnifying that from the individual, from the internal to the external, to the civilizational, I think that's where we're, we're at. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, well said. Um, Gipster has this word, uh, and towards his, the end of his life, he said, you know, we need to cultivate a primal trust or primordial trust. And it is kind of like that, that act of taking that leap, you know, because, ego like superseding the ego requires a little bit of an ego death you know like you have to surrender you have to step into that abyss and you're not you you are not sure how you're going to end up and it's that vulnerability right that that is the beginning of everything we're talking about in terms of um uh Gepster talk, calls, calls the integral consciousness um spiritual freedom it, it requires you to actually kind of surrender yourself to be in a position of, of vulnerability again. Um, it's very hard for, for moderns to do that. And I think again, why the psychedelic community is uniquely situated, like they practice ego death quite a bit. <laughs> um, and I think as a civilization, it's kind of what we need to be going through. And it seems like that's what the planet is offering us right now <laughs> in mm-hmm. terms of like a collective, ego death like oh we can't continue the way in which our culture has been operating for the past few hundred years what on earth are we going to be if we have to give this up you know what are we going to become 
um, I, I mentioned it in one of my classes, uh, lectures, um, it's a kind of, it's a kind of a, a like consummation, right? Like you're part of this like weird marriage with the spiritual, right? It, it's, you're being initiated into this thing and it's already started. And like, you're actually kind of now, um, like kind of on a precipice, right? Like you, you didn't realize it maybe up until this moment, but you're about to kind of go into this process, whether you like it or not. And I think <laughs> that's sort of where we're at at the moment culturally, you know, but right. to practice that before we need to be forced to do that could do so much service for helping that along, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think, I think it was Sophia that said this recently, I forget where, but she's uh, Sophia Rockland to, to die before you die, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's, um, Wow. I mean, I, I, I love talking with you. I feel like I learned so much and there's just this invitation and, 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 uh, um, uh, it, this way of, of, of newness and hope, I think as well, which sometimes I get a little bogged down in the, in the dark, the darkness of things sometimes. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure, man. You, you referred a little bit to like what you've been, uh, doing and what your work is about, but maybe tell people more about, uh, you know, where they can find you, what, maybe what you're currently working on, what's uh, taken up a lot of your time. Well, thanks Mike. This has been really fun. And I had a feeling we'd probably end up just riffing naturally for an hour or two without noticing the time passing. And that's exactly what, <laughs> what happened. So I appreciate you bringing me on the show. Um, yeah, so uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm hosting a class right now. I mean, folks can still register for it if they like. Most of it's pre-recorded. Um, it's a read through of the Ever Present Origin by Gene Gepser, um, curated chapters, and um, I'm also incorporating my book my book into it. And there's multimedia and and PowerPoint shows, and because Gepser uses a lot of art, so I think it's nice to kind of actually have a supplementary kind of guidebook as you go through. Um, so I'm, I'm hosting that right now. And just in terms of what I'm working on, um, I've got the Mutations podcast and uh, working on a book slowly and surely. Um, it's called, tentatively called Fragments of an Integral Futurism. And mm. I'm, it's just a placeholder title and it's inspired directly by David Graeber. And um, cool. I don't know if I'll be bold enough to keep it because I, I don't know, maybe it's too close to his title, but um, it, it's exploring a lot of what we talked about today, just in terms of like, reclaiming time, reclaiming a sense of the future in a very different way than um, the way in which modernity has imagined it, right? Um, a kind of an integral sense of time. So working on that right now as well. Um, a little bit later this year, there's a couple of different books coming out through Revelor Press that I've been helping, uh, but I'll just mention one called Mutations, and it's an anthology with a couple of different philosophers, psychedelic researchers, VR researchers, um, Oh, cool. It's a really interesting combination of people. They're not all Gepsarian or anything, but it's thematically kind of like what is emerging? How is our sense of time, space, and self shifting? And um, we might spend a little bit of time actually updating it now that COVID has happened, but it's at least uh, going to be due out this fall. So folks could uh, look out for that as well. And cool. uh, oh, I got my Patreon too, of course. So if you want to hang out with me and have these conversations, feel free to sign up for that. Yeah, and and uh, liminal, right? Liminal. Uh... Oh yes, that's so new. I always forget to mention it. <laughs> um, liminal magazine. We just launched it. Uh, Daniel Pinchback and uh, uh, a couple of folks. We've all come together. It's it's um, how to how to say this succinctly. Um, it, it's about everything we talk about, like in this podcast, uh, being in between one culture and another, and trying to navigate that space. It's a magazine, so if folks are interested in submitting something, reach out to me. Um, I'm very excited about it. There's just a lot of potential and possibility and need for that right now. Yeah. Just, um, uh, Daniel, you founded uh, reality sandwich back in the day and we worked together on that. I, I was an editor for reality sandwich. So I feel like it's kind of in the spirit of these countercultural publications, uh, like Mondo 2000 or high frontiers or disinformation. Like, um, it just felt like it was time to bring another, another iteration of that forward again. So, um, that's sort of also what I'm working on. So many hats. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I read some, some good articles on there and, uh, um, it looks really cool too. So they say the aesthetics are nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. Um, yeah. Great. And your JDJ writes on 
Instagram yeah, and uh, on yes, where do you want people Instagram. to follow you? I don't want to just give out your handles. <laughs> JBJ writes on Twitter. It's a great place to start. Twitter. Mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Great. Thanks. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll put all these links in the show notes and stuff so people can, you know, this is just the, the tip of the, the iceberg. I think, you know, we, we kind of meandered through, uh, through a lot of this stuff, but you're really going in depth on it. And I can't wait to finish the, the book seeing through the world. Uh, always a pleasure to talk with you on, and, and I guess I'll see you in the, in the tank next see isolation tank. tank. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks cool. again. You got it. Well, I really enjoyed that conversation. I hope you guys did too. Uh, And I definitely hope to get more uh, educated in the field of Gene Gebser and the work that Jeremy's doing and uh, really uh, excited to dive deeper into this uh, realm. And if you do too, please check out those links that I put in the show notes. And uh, yeah, just everything is in the show notes. So you can go and you can click on there. If you want to leave a five-star rating and review for the podcast on Apple Podcasts, you can go and support the show that way. You uh, just click the link in the show notes that I have. It'll take you right there. Laid it all out, made it really easy for you. And, um, you know, if you don't feel like doing that, but you like the show, just tell people about it, share it, like, subscribe. Let's make sure to spread uh, these ideas around. And uh, if you want to go a step further, you can go to patreon.com slash Mike Brank, or you can search Mike Adelic or Mike Adelic Podcast on Patreon and become a patron and select the tier membership that you want and get access to bonus episodes, get access to the Mike Adelic Inner Sanctum Discord server, and get access to all kinds of other fun bonuses and treats and goodies coming uh, all the time for different levels of membership. It's great. I'm looking forward to really uh, nurturing this community over there more and uh, hope you can can join us over there. Also, if you want to check out CBD products, go to hempbombs.com, put in the code Mike15 at checkout and get 15% off all your CBD related things. Shout out to Danny Barnett and Galaxia for the intro and outro music. And thanks a lot for listening, everyone. Until next time, much love. Peace.